the chief usually drives 001. Haverhill's police chief at the time was Jeff Williams, but he has never admitted to being on scene or on duty the night of Mars' crash. What would be the one question you would ask him if you had one question? What did you do with Maura Murray? You wanted the best, you got the best. The hottest podcast in the world, True Crime Monkey! Thank you once again to all the True Crime Monkey watchers out there on YouTube. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe buttons so we can bring you more episodes like the one you're getting ready to see. This bonus episode in the Mario Murray series is from the 2017 town hall meeting held by John Smith on the 13th anniversary of Mara's disappearance. I want to give out a special thanks to Tim and Lance of the Missing Podcast who actually did the video recording and granted us permission to use it here on True Crime Monkey. This is Susan Champy, who uh, is a bartender at a place in Moon Mountain and lived on Fred Pawn Road in Havel. And that night, Susan had left work at Moon Mountain at approximately 7.30 p.m. And on her way home, came across the accident scene. When she came across the accident scene, which more than likely put her in that area right around 7.55, <clears throat> she only noticed <coughs> excuse me, she only noticed the sedan yes, uh, sedan number 002 cable cruiser she noticed a police officer standing there and she noticed two bystanders and these are people that we have no idea who these bystanders were fire department was not there yet EMS was not there yet so we want to know who the two people were that were standing there talking to Sergeant Smith because he said no one came out of their houses that night to help them. So another question that we would like to answer is who those people were. Uh, so there's so much that surrounds the accident scene that just does not make sense and stuff that we've been told by law enforcement is being contradicted by our witnesses. I'm not sure, but I can't figure out why witness A, Karen McNamara, would insert herself into her case two days later for no reason. Why would you do that? Why would you call for information if you, you, know, you don't have to become involved? She called them to give them her information, and she was told what she was told. We don't want to talk about it. So we have that, and then we have Susan Champy who comes along. And she's got her information of what she saw. And not only did she see Cecil Smith, but she saw two bystanders who we don't know who they are. And here's the kicker. When they found the vehicle, it was locked. No keys. But yet, when Susan Champion went by, she stated that the passenger side door was open out into the lane of traffic. How did they get in the vehicle? Why did they get in the vehicle? Because in that circumstance, you've got to have a warrant to go inside that vehicle. More than likely, anyone that knows what a slim gym is, it's to open vehicles with. The cops carry them all the time. They do vehicle walkouts all the time. You'd be in a vehicle in 15 seconds. And more than likely, that is what occurred that night, unless we're being lied to about that the car was locked. Um, so it's another question of that it's just not been answered yet, and we want answers to all of these questions. The next thing that we're going to step into is the fact that when Butch Atwood was questioned by the police and a few days later shown a picture of Moore, his exact words were, I'll, I guess, I suppose that could be her. So what I want to toss out there now is that there is no that can tell me 100% fact that we know that it was Moore Murray at the corner that night. It is more than likely Moore Murray. 
but I'm not going to go on the words of Butch Atwood, who is looking at a person that he has never seen before. It is dark out. She's been in an accident, disheveled, shaking, and cold. And he is able to say, on three days later, go, I suppose that could be her. That's not definitive enough for me to say, I agree that, you know, that's what happened. Like, again, yeah, I'm not saying that it wasn't war at the car, but I'm saying that the chance that it wasn't. Did Maura leave Massachusetts? More than likely. Is it possible that she didn't leave Massachusetts? Somebody else was driving her car? It's a possibility. I don't think it's highly up there on the list, but I think it is a possibility. It's something that we really can't believe. Now, the ATM videos that were taken in Massachusetts when Maura was leaving, she checked that she went to the bank and took out $280, almost emptied her account. And that was uh, sometime around 3.30 or something in the afternoon. And she had made some uh, telephone calls and she ended up leaving, or the last phone call was at 4.37, the final call when she checked her voicemail. Um, so the indications are of what Maura was doing certainly indicates that it was her coming this way. There was some type of reason that she was coming here. No one knows. Mr. Murray doesn't know. Um, he's been searching for 13 years, and he hasn't gotten the answer yet. So the big question here, too, with the ATM video is we know that there was a liquor store stop. She went in there. That's not a big deal. Um, I don't. That video has not been seen, to my knowledge, uh, by any of the family. The ATM video was not released. The ATM video was held for up until about a year ago, not even. Uh, a year at the most. A year at the most, when finally, after much persistence and by Mr. Murray, as well as myself online, stating that that's what we want, we want to see it. They finally got together with Mr. Murray, and they shared with him still photos of the video. They did not show him the whole video. And I want to know why. The only thing Mr. Murray had to go by to say, yes, that was my daughter at the ATM, was a couple still photos. Why are they not, if there's something in that video that is evidence, then it should have all been classified as evidence. And we should have been told that. But it's never been said but yet they don't want to share it. So that's, you know, why won't they share whatever else was going on in that video? I think that's another thing that makes sense to me that it's an important item. Um, my, my question is, and here now, is to try and figure out exactly why Maura Murray ended up at the Weather Barrett Corner on February 9, 2004. Um, and the reason that I asked that, and I know that, that the Murrays were familiar with the area, they've been up here hiking before, but, and I don't know how much you've actually used that route. Never. Never. So, at any time, you go to your friend Matt Quest, and Matt Quest, when you say, I want to go from UMass Amherst to Bartlett, New Hampshire, which is where Ms. Murray believes that she was headed because of a call that was on her uh, phone to a condo. Place. But if you type that in, you get three different results, and not one of them is to take Route 112 in Woodsville and go over to Lincoln and go up over the Kangamangas Highway in the middle of February. I mean, you wouldn't do it. And then with this, it gives you three different scenarios that you more than likely would have stayed on Route 302, gone up to Littleton, and gone that way. You could have come out of Massachusetts, gone over to 93 and gone up that way. And you also could have taken, um, sorry, uh, in Brattleboro, Vermont, you could have got and gone over through Keene and gone over to Concord and gone up that way. So they give you three different options. But Route 112 or Farrakhan is not one. Uh, on Warren's computer uh, that, they, that the police checked, they described it as having that she had uh, earlier in the day and in the, the days, the couple days preceding, she had 
looked up stuff on pregnancy, um, which we, you know, we're not sure whether it had something to do with schoolwork. I don't think anybody really knows that. Um, we don't know. She made the stove, uh, a phone call to Go Stowe, which is a place over in Stowe, Vermont, the um, <coughs> She did not get through. Um, the, the phones were out of line, uh, out of service that day. Uh, she also made uh, references on the internet or uh, inquiries on the internet to Berkshire's in Burlington, Vermont. So all of those are kind of indicating that, yeah, you would take 91 and you would go all the way up 91 and you would take and go to wherever you want to go to go over to Burlington or you go to Parkside or do whatever you want to do. So she had called that Linda lady at the condo. Linda, and this is another interesting thing is, you know, the police have and have had for years, they've had Laura Murray's cell phone records. And when someone goes missing, when you don't check all the people on that cell phone record, you're not being thorough. And the one that they didn't check for the longest time was the condominium call for They never spoke to Linda Salomon until, I think it was a couple of years later, maybe. <clears throat> yeah, I think it was two years later. It was a long time. And by that time, Linda Solomon does not really even remember the phone call. It was a very short phone call. Do you have a place available? No, I don't. In the phone call ended. But another question of why did they never go and talk to that lady for two years? It it breathes it breathes the belief that they didn't think they had to because they already knew something. No need to do that. We know the answer. We have an answer. We have something we're looking at. But we're talking about 13 years later or 12 years later, 11 years later now after she came forward and we're still sitting on the same chair not knowing where we're going and we have to move and that's ridiculous um so i mean i'm pretty much at the point where i told you everything that i can tell you um about what we know and the oddities and inaccuracies from the scene um my my two biggest scenarios that I'm going to go into now, what I believe happened was, and I'm not going to go into big detail about it, but the fact that we know, and I believe 100% that witness A is so credible, and in fact she was told by the police that she was a credible witness. If they tell you you're a credible witness, but yet then they tell you that you don't know what the hell you're talking about, what are you talking about? First you tell me I'm credible, and then I'm not? because it suits you, okay? So, I don't know what happened that night. I don't know why the SUV was there. I don't know if it had anything to do with it, but the answers, the, the questions that surround that night in that area are questions that need to be answered. We should get answers. They're simple answers that would not interfere with this case, would not interfere with the prosecution of this case, unless it is one of their own, all right? And I'm going to leave it to that because I don't want to blame anybody. I can't blame anybody. We don't know who was driving that cruiser. But again, I know that cruiser was there. I believe with Miss A. Believe, uh, she has phone records. She know what time she got out of work. And I said to her, I said to Karen. I said, Karen, I said that. Uh, you sure you saw an SUV? <laughs> And her words to me was, I know what a friggin' ass you do. <laughs> okay? And I had to get it out of her myself because I wanted to hear it come out of her mouth. You know? And they pretty much told this lady sitting here that she did not know what the hell she was talking about. She didn't know the difference between an SUV and a sedan. She didn't know the difference between an SUV and a regular car. And you see 001 reflected, you all know what a cruiser looks like, you all know how reflective they are. She saw that 001 on the cruiser once on Swiftwater Road, the second time on Route 112, and the third time at the scene, nose to nose with that cruiser. So, that's what I want to know. I want, I want to know who's driving that cruiser. I think we deserve answers to that. It wasn't out of service. If it was out of service, prove it to me, prove what they did. I want to see the, the paperwork that says you had a tune-up or 
you know, the transmission line or whatever. But we know it was in service 4.30 that day. And the fact that they would all of a sudden put it in out of service, I don't know. I, I sorry, it, I think it's a lie. Um, my, my second thing that we want to look at is uh, our second, or well, I guess we should call it third or fourth with this, because we're talking about Rick Forcier, who lived on the corner of Bradley Hill Road in Route 112. And he was in, he could see the accident scene from his house if he was coming home to it at that point in time. When Rick was first interviewed by the Indian Police investigators, he told them that he was at home sleeping on his couch that night. And that he didn't hear a thing. And when he was two and a half months later, when Rick Forcier came forward, he stated that, oh no, I was coming home from a work job in Franconia, and it must have been just about eight o'clock, and I passed what he believed to be a female jogging down the road on Route 112 by Route 116, uh, either north or south, I'm not sure which one, that's never been figured out, but they're all within a mile of each other. So, but it's four to five miles east of the scene. So we're back to the east now. So if Mr. Murray, something that you've been asking for for years, if they would have gone to the east, maybe they would have seen more Murray if Rick Forcier is really telling us the truth. It's quite a distance, four or five miles in the winter, not knowing exactly how she was dressed, but she was a runner. She was very athletic. It is possible. I have questions about believing Mr. Forcier's statements because of the fact that he didn't come forward until two and a half months later. Uh, when he did come forward, he told that story. Um, and it makes no sense to me that a man that lives from here to outside of the vehicles out there from the, where the Saturn was found, that that night, <coughs> if you state the truth from the second statement that you were coming home, there's no way he would not have seen the commotion. There's no way you wouldn't have seen the, the lights flashing off the white buildings in the snow. There's just no possible way that he could have ignored that that night. And then, for two and a half months, we have, we have not only the state police on the road on Thursday, we have the whole Murray family and their whole clan up here looking for days, out putting up flyers. And you've got a guy who lives right there and says, I didn't see anything in two and a half months. Another one that just drives me crazy. The guy could, maybe it's nothing. Maybe the guy's just an idiot. He didn't want people to search, the police to search properly. Maybe he's just, he just doesn't care for any attention or whatever. But, you know, why did he change his story? You know, these are the things that keep happening is these people change their story. Which Atwood changed his story basically three times. Um, you know, you've got Dave Weston saying that they saw somebody with a kind of smoking cigarette, and whether there was or not, it's what's in the narrative, it's what we have to develop. Please. Oh, I think it's important to note uh, um, how Rick Forcier, you see, said he came forward. Um, yes. It's important to note how it came forward, that he didn't go, come forward. Oh, yeah, he did not come uh, forward on his own volition. Uh, he was actually. As some people like to call him, he's quite the storyteller. Um, and he, you know, he said things like, oh yeah, I've got more, you know, in my summer, she's a great cook. Um, but, you know, there were some things that were said by him that were, were just totally out of line. And then he actually, at the store, he was at the local store talking about what he thought he had seen two and a half months earlier. And someone actually heard him saying that, and that is how the police actually ended up going to see him and get in touch with him. Um, yes. It's also important to know that it actually didn't get to by the police themselves within the initial 10 days and didn't call him at this end. Right, right. Exactly. So, again, what, what do we have? What, what stories that, that are different? What stories that keep changing? It, you've, got, you've got all these people in this circle around where more of town and every one of their stories is, it seems like it's bullshit. But they can't. Can they all be in on it? 
No, I, I don't think so. But why are the lies? Why are the, why is it that's not there? I, I just I just don't understand it. I can't I can't get past it. I can't let it go. I, it's just it's not gonna happen. Hey John. Yes. Yes. And that after he sold that trailer, that that was searched by police? Yes, he refused to have his uh, trailer that he was living in while he was building his house searched at the time. When he did sell the trailer, it was sold to somebody in Lyme, New Hampshire. When it arrived on the scene in Lyme, it was taken into custody by the police, um, searched, and what I believe was cleared from what we've been told. Do we know that that's true? I haven't seen a piece of paper that says there's no evidence there, but that's pretty much what they said was that they didn't find any evidence. Yes, Chris. Exactly right. the truth you don't have to remember anything right. when you tell a lie you have to remember it all so just one little white lie people we all know how it works done it before uh -huh. you know one light white lie turns into a big can of worms let's say and that's exactly what this case is about this case is not only looking for more murder this case has opened up so many more things that are happening in the community that people were not aware of. I'm a local, I'm 58 years old. I'm from here, stuff that I've never heard about, that I'm hearing about, and it's it's just, you, you don't fathom it. You know, you think, it, no, it's not happening. It's a small town, everyone would know about it. But as I like to call it, I, I, it's the, the small, you know, the silence in a small town. It seems like it's silence in a small town. People either are being silent, I mean, I'm sorry, people either being silent or being silent. Okay? Um, I guess my other thing would just be that I, that I really want to go over pretty quick here and then we'll go on and uh, get Mark Harper and his group here from MJA Investigations. They've been looking into more cases with well, Free Air Maitland and several others for many years now. Um, but before we do that, I just want to say that, you know, it is possible ability that Moore was abducted and murdered by an unknown person, people that we don't have in our view. This person that she, it is still possible, and you have to look at all the cases that we've seen around the nation, that she is, was abducted and she's being held captive and still being held captive to this day. It's something that you can't disprove. Fair possible that she did get away from the scene, wandered off in the woods 20 miles away and perished to the elk. It is possible. It is possible that her bones and her remains would never be found. Is it possible that she committed suicide? Um, again, if that was something that she did by going into the woods, we would probably never find it. Um, I don't know. Most people don't usually go, you know, walk or whatever. They only go to a hotel or whatever. But you know, we don't know. It's, it's something that I don't trust in because of what she had with her. It doesn't seem like a person that was going to commit suicide. She had too much stuff with her. You know, you would have grabbed your quickest thing and said, what the hell do I need that? You know? Um, and the last one is that she ran off the start of the life. And I don't know how many people think that that's possible in this day and age. Um, people think that she went to Canada. Um, I find that it's really hard to believe that in Canada that she would be able to go 13 years without being noticed. Um, if she had gotten a new ID or identity, I mean, these things, you know, the Canadian healthcare system, whenever you go to a doctor, wherever you go, you've got to check in and show all your credentials, not just once, every time you go. So, again, don't know. I don't believe more is in Canada. I, so I really 
take off a wet flea, my highest suspect thought is that she was no longer with me. That's my opinion. And I think what I'm going to finish with right now is this, this is something that um, that people online have been giving me shit about. <laughs> it's really annoying me. And it's the uh, Haverhill Police Department, 2004, the report for 2004. And in that report, there's three kidnappings for that year in Haverhill, New Hampshire. There's three kidnappings in Haverhill, New Hampshire. One of them was in February. I have people online telling me, what's the big deal, three kidnappings in Haverhill? What are the chances that, not saying one of the people on this list is Laura Murray, but that she was kidnapped? Mm -hmm. It's very possible, isn't it? You've got three in one year. I've got people trying to tell me, well, that could have been some guy keeping his wife in the cellar. <laughs> you know? Maybe, I don't know, maybe she keeps him in the closet. I mean, I don't know. It, it, it just doesn't make any sense. It just doesn't make any John, sense. The people who believe that. Yes? Uh, I lived in North Haverhill at the time of this. I don't know, I never heard of it. I've never heard of it. That should have been yeah. like a um, coffee morning talk. And, and you see, no you know, music because of silence yeah. in the hall. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. This is the old part of it. Thank you. I wonder how to strangle this. <laughs> well, you know, I'm going to continue because you've got 11 forcible fondlings in one year, one forcible rape in one year, two forcible sodomies in one year. This is Harry Blue Ant for both. Okay. Two impersonations. I'd like those to find. What would be impersonation? Somebody impersonating a police officer. Good question. Yeah. Um, and those were in April and October. 67. 67 cases of intimidation. Oh, that's good. <laughs> intimidation is when somebody feels that you could say something to get them arrested so that you go and tell them. If you do anything, I'm going to take care of you oh, or do whatever. Intimidation by the police? No, intimidation by people, by people towards other people. So is it, was it somebody that was a witness to whatever that they saw and they didn't give them up and the people went and said, if you do this, you know, you're going to be in serious trouble. Well, and that's the thing, Six, especially 67 cases of intimidation. So. Did they give the names? No, this is just a report of total numbers of what they what they did. Anybody, we can go into the names of who these people were about that year? Uh, that is my mission now, is to, I am trying to get the Jackson County Sheriff's Department hand over law, that's one of the biggest things I want, and I want the information behind these cases. Anything that's not open, we should be able to get through the Freedom of Information Act, but it's going to be a pain in the ass because you've got to file one for each one. Um, I can't say I want all 67, okay? And that's the problem. And it's going to be tedious. But maybe with all the people we got here today, somebody wants to chip in and help, step up to the plate and meet state one, and send out our freedom of information request. It's not going to show me doing 30 of them. It's going to show a community getting together to ask for answers. And that's what we want. This community deserves the answers. You people are paying your taxes. You're paying for the police to be here to do their job. And you should be able to feel safe in your society. And when you have stuff like this going on, and I don't know how many people have read any of the comments that are in the 6,000 uh, signature petition, but some of those comments are very, very powerful. And it's from townspeople. It's from people all over the world, but it's from townspeople who are upset, pissed off, and ready about, their heads are about ready to explode from the fact that I know, they say that I know this stuff has been going on. I know this stuff goes on. So, the, the little Hamlet town of Haverhill, New Hampshire, ain't as pretty as everybody wants to be. And I'm not picking on Haverhill in particular, only except because this is where more of it disappeared from. And like I've been told, we'll go to any other town and dig up this paperwork or whatever. I don't need any other town. I, I'm not, I don't need to compare it to another town. It don't matter. It didn't happen in another town. It happened in Hamilton, New Hampshire. 
Two cases of prostitution, both in October. Four runaways, January, February, September, October. 12 simple assaults, oh, I'm sorry, 72. 72 simple assaults, maybe something to do with the intimidation part as well. I'm going to finish off with eight statutory rapes. So we have a community that is not as perfect as everyone would like to believe it is. And that's what I want to stress to you people today. That's what I've been trying to stress to the media. That's what I've been trying to stress to the online people and the people that follow this case and want the answers is that you cannot deny what we've seen. You cannot throw it to the side and say that it does not matter. I have people online looking at this and throwing it in my face and saying, you don't know what you're talking about. It does not matter. Yes, it does. It does matter. Does anybody else have any questions or would like to make it? Um, uh, any of these cases that you The officer who we, we believe was driving the SUV number 001 that night would have been Chief Jeff Williams. Chief Jeff Williams is no longer with the force. Uh, I believe it was in 2009 that he got arrested for um, DWI by one of his own officers and was um, called the state police to have them come and take care of the case. I believe that was the final straw for Cecil Smith with Chief Williams. Chief Williams um, is a known alcoholic, um, known to drink on the job, and we were told that he was drunk at 4.30 in the afternoon when they put him into that cruiser. John? Yes. Is there anyone other than Williams that had access to George Harlan that night? We don't know that um, because of what the police are telling us with the saying that it was out of service. Yes. It makes you wonder that, you know, who who could have had access to it? Who's actually thrown that around? Could it have been, could it have been in service after that afternoon? If the mechanic was out joyriding around in it? You know? I don't think so. I mean, it's a small town, you'd probably be noticed pretty quick. You know? yeah. And they'd say, hey, what, what was that mechanic doing out you know? <laughs> um, Yeah, you go out and test drive, but you don't do it with full lights. And you don't pull those to nose with a Saturn. So, um, so this just, it, the, there's so many things, oh, oh, and then, um, so Williams is gone. Um, Sergeant Smith uh, actually left in 2012, I believe, he retired. He, was, he had gone up to be the chief. He retired, and now the chief can handle his uh, chief, Byron Charles. And he was actually one of the ones who was working the night that Moore was missing as well. But we don't really have any information on Byron Charles. I've never put him near the scene. Um, by any account, we've never seen it, anything that would indicate that. Unless he was the person driving us, would be zero to one. But again, we don't know that, so. Uh, anybody else? That's not everybody. What's that? There's another officer. Oh, yeah, so um, I think what we, we should share too is we have the New Hampshire State Police Officer, John Monaghan, who was at the scene and who Fred Murray is definitely adamant about finding out why he was there considering no report was filed. John Monaghan has since left um, the New Hampshire State Police. Uh, he is now the chief in Frank County, New Hampshire. Um, I know him personally. I think he's a nice guy. I've talked to him about this case. I've asked him questions about this case. And I don't know, he seemed forthright, honest with me, looked me in the eye. But he's a cop, so they're trained to look me in the eye. Um, did he outright deny anything? Did he outright deny? Did he, did he have seen that? No. No. He said, he finally told me, he said, yeah, I was there. But this was, this was like two years ago that I met John. I, I know John for, since he took over Franconia, but um, this was probably a year or so ago that I talked to him about the village store in Franconia that come right out and asked him, like, so where were you coming from? Because I knew where he was coming from. Because I had the shirt in the back of the was saying that I'm in Lisbon at 7.15. And we know that, now we know that he wasn't the scene. 
if that has come out from the New Hampshire State Police, yes, he was there. But we still want to know why there's no report that he was there and no report of what he did to help with the search that thing. Uh, as far as other um, people involved that were working that night, another interesting fact that just, just I don't know, this case is so weird to me over the years, it's so many things follow you around, but not only is John Monahan the chief in Franconia now, but the other officer that is the second in command, his sergeant, Matt Cashin, was another police officer that was working on the night more and very Keep the crew together, you know, I don't, I don't know. I, again, I, I, I don't, I, I can't wait because we don't know. But the speculation is there, you have to have it, you can't say it doesn't exist. You know, I have people all the time telling me you're speculating too much. Cops speculate every day. You know, do you think they just sit in a room and just look at all the facts? No, they say, well, what's this going to happen? I suppose this going to happen. You know, you don't throw stuff away, you don't ignore it. Is there any other questions or whatever? Uh, Lance, which way is uh, Lisbon? Which direction? If you were to go back to uh, Route 302, you would take a right out of here and go to Lisbon. His time would have been. Uh, Um, and this is another interesting point that I think I'll make is it seems to me that the New Hampshire State Police was pressing the suicide issue, okay? I want to know why, because I don't believe if it, it, they say it had something to do with the rag in the tailpipe, that's, that's crap. You don't commit yourself, you can't stick a rag in the tailpipe and commit suicide. And not on the side of the road. And not on the side of the road. Yeah, I think I'm packed here in front of the Westman's house. <laughs> So, you know, you, you've got that, and then at 6, uh, what time is it here? Uh, around 7.30 that night, no, around 7 p.m. that night, almost all the local police were at the local hospital because of a person trying to attempt suicide. Okay? At 6 o'clock that night, Step back just a little bit, but at six o'clock that night, there was another suicide attempt in Lebanon. After Laura Murray's accident and they cleared from the scene, the next call that Sergeant Smith responded to was a report of a suicidal kid from the Beckett School up on the power line. So you've got a suicide before, you've got a suicide in Lebanon, attempt to Lebanon. You've got a suicide at the power lines, and there's another one too. I, I don't know where it is right now, but there's another one that I found in, like in Bridgewater, Bristol area. And so that's four. So were they trying to group Laura Murray into a night of suicides to make it easier on them? It's just something I want to throw out there because it just seems obvious that that's what they've been trying to push for years, and it makes it easy. Chris. Well, and that's that's the problem that we have is that it was not treated as evidence. It was brought to his personal garage. You know, and that's the thing is he brought it to his personal garage. When Mr. Murray saw the car on Friday, he had to take that car. He didn't have to take it off then. He took it off that night when he brought it to his house. He took it off the flatbed, put it into his personal garage, and then when Fred Murray came, he sat in the car and drove back up. So when he brings the Saturn finally down to the boys' auto cave, his real garage, he's going to take it back out of the garage, put it back up on the flatbed. Right. What sense does that make? None. Unless they were using his garage as a secure spot for that night. But again, I'd like to see in the report where it says that that car was towed to see if it says that it was towed to his garage or his home. Do you think that's just because they were treating it as if a crime could not have taken place? I think if there was, if they did think a crime would have taken place, I think they would have just towed it and left it on the back of the flat. I mean, in his driveway, he was gone to sleep. Right. But the fact that you took it off and put it in your garage and did not treat the rag as evidence for the trip on the back of the vehicle. It wasn't covered, it wasn't treated yeah. as evidence. So I mean I could 
say, you know, they took the car off because he had another call and had to put another car on there. I mean, I guess there's a million reasons why. Very true. But legally speaking, I guess, is my question is that, you know, if you, if you pick up a car from a possible crime scene, mm -hmm. obviously you can't take two to the garage. And you wouldn't think so, right? No, they were treating it as a, as a, but suicide she was going, she walked crime. away. What's that? Suicide is a crime, and that was their first, I know. they were pushing. Right. So right there, that really doesn't make sense. These and are the things, things that don't make sense. Things that they yep. So my understanding is that the event, that tow company wasn't even supposed to be on duty. Right, right, exactly right. And as Byron was just saying, to take it off to go get another call, he shouldn't have gotten another call that night. Because he wasn't in rotation. He wasn't supposed to get that one. So thank you for saying that because that just made me think that he didn't have, you know, he shouldn't have been getting calls. He should have been going to the team. So why would you? And why would, I think that's sort of telling that they would give the man a standard would end up in his personal garage. That just doesn't add up or it's not right or it seems like they're hiding something. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, yes. I have three questions that are in this same line. Um, and I'm not from here, so forgive me if I don't have the right information. The person who picked up the truck, is it LaVoy? Yes. Three questions about that individual. Was, his, was he in the business of detailing autos, or was he in the business of, like, fixing them? He his auto care, so he was, he was a repair man. I don't think he did any body restoration or auto body Interior work. Detailing? I don't believe so. Okay. But I, I don't, I've never dug that deep into that. Yeah, that's interesting but. to me. Also, from where the car would have been picked up to his house, did he pass his business? No. Damn it. All right. <laughs> right, right, and I asked myself I the same question. Oh, I know. Um, I know, right? I was onto it there for a minute. Um, does he have any connection to the police department in as much as a personal connection or a business connection, i.e. he would have a contract with the police department to take care of the cruises? Well, that's what we don't know, is where they had their vehicles worked on. We don't know. Would that okay, well, like, get but that should forward? be, but it, I, you don't see it. It just says, you know, and nobody steps forward and says we do it. So that's what we would need. That's interesting. But they're aware they take their cars. Yes. Do we know how many employees work for the whole life of the time? Possibly three, I think. And where I'm going with it, his garage has no fence around it. At right. All. Is there any chance he could have just been taken to his house to make sure that there was no interference with employees yes. or anything like that? Yes, it is. Yep. You know, and like I said, the biggest reason that I find it on is because he was called and not looked at. And that's why I'm grouping it together. But you're perfectly right. Was there any president? Have you ever done this <coughs> any other accidents? Right. And, and who would know? I mean, we wouldn't be able to find that out unless we had somebody that actually had an accident and maybe told it. Well, I guess we would find that information out. Yes, Kat? One more quick one. You got it. Um, I don't know the ethics of people who do that business, and I don't pretend to. But I am married to a detective, so maybe that's where my brain's going. Um, so if, if I'm on call and she's not, and she gets the call, she's going to say, I'm not on call, call her. Is it like who gets there first? Or is it is it an ethical thing where I'm on call tonight? So why didn't Northrop go, I guess? Oh, North oh, okay. Why didn't they go? Or if, if the other person got the call, the boy, yep. Why would you go if it wasn't your night to go out? Northland did go. He, he did, Northland did show up at the scene to argue with. Right, but why would he go at all? Exactly. He should have said, I'm not, not off call. I'm not off call. I mean, off he probably was sitting at home doing nothing and said, I have 100 bucks. 100 bucks. That's but me good. in February, I've been going, ah, it's cold out. I don't know. <laughs> right, so I think that's true. That's really curious. <laughs> um, yeah. You're welcome. Yes. Who actually called the boys? Was it, was it Cecil Smith that called the boys? 
Well, you know, that is, is a good question because, I mean, usually when the, the dispatch talks to the officer, they'll say, okay, he wanted to send a, a 28 a, a record. And um, when they ask that question, sometimes they will ask, well, who do you want us to call? But that's usually with it because of distance, you know. Somehow well, on interstate or This is the second that the, another terrorist or one might right there. Is there, is, do we know for a fact it was the dispatch that called the boys? No, we don't. And the thing that's interesting about it too is Dick McKean is much closer. Dick McKean is right in Woodsville. Um, the boys is another really six, seven miles down the route path. So again, why did they call him? Why did he come further than North Atlantic? It's a good question. Oh, and who called him? And who called him? And that's what that that could be. That could be those handover records that they that they are denying us. Yeah, they won't give them to uh, the Freedom of Information Act did not release the handover records, and that is where, which happens when he called, he got transferred to the 911 up here was busy supposedly, and he got transferred through to Hanover. They hung up the phone with him, and then uh, dispatch called back the applicant and asked them what was going on, and he said, she said, and he talked to Barbara afterwards. Her words were, my husband just witnessed the actor, came home to call, and said no idea where the he was. That was the words that we had. But what I believe is in those handover records is more of the narrative of what we really want to know. Because I think that somebody there saw something go down. And that's why people's stories have changed over the years. People are scared. Whether it be the cops, whether it then Rick Corsier, who people are afraid of, or whether it been somebody that from the local area that said, you know, we have the whole red truck scenario, which could be nothing, that could be just a total red hair. But somebody might have known that red truck, and it's a real scumbag, as Mr. Murray likes to call the local, the local dirt bag, you know. Um, and trust me, they're out there. The subculture that I have brought into doing this scares the hell out of me. Because I'm from here, and I, you know, you don't think it. You don't really think that those things go on. And when you hear that they are and the crazy stuff that's going on, it, it's out of the realm. You just don't you just don't think it happens, you know. So, you know, we're we're in this dilemma. We've been here 13 years, um, and it it's all based around some serious, serious questions that need to be answered. And I'm gonna leave you with that. Um last one more question, sorry. Sure. When does something like this, a single car accident, when no one at the scene become a criminal investigation? If there was some sign that there was criminal activity. <laughs> but as we've heard here by other people saying, you know, you, you know, you slide off the road or whatever, you've had a couple beers, or sure. say you don't have a license, you freaking book it out of there and leave the car, you know? Sure. So that's probably, initially, that's probably what they're thinking. But the fact that, and we know from reconstructionists that have looked at this car, two reconstructionists have stated that there is no way that the Saturn hit the tree on the corner that night. The damage is not consistent with that. The damage is consistent with something that was as high as the damage to the front. Okay? This plastic spoiler bumper cover down here is completely fiberglass. I don't know if anyone's ever been in an accident in the middle of the winter or even the summer, but in the middle of the winter, fiberglass splinters. It breaks and it splinters because it's so cold. This part of the car, which sticks up this much further than that headlight indentation, the only thing that was wrong with this was a couple of those little clips that hold it together and hold it onto its thing were broken off. But it's not cracked, it's not broken, it is not totally dislodged from the vehicle. So you tell me how the police can stand there and say that this vehicle hit a tree when it's obvious that how did the tree get past that much to get in and make that indentation? It doesn't take a brain surgeon to figure out that one. It takes common sense to look at that. Another one that I'm arguing online with people telling me I don't know what I'm talking about. You can go to hell. Right? I got no issue with telling you that because look at it. I mean, people sitting here right now looking at it going, no, they're shaking their head, no. 
So it's not just me yelling. You said one question. I lied. <laughs> <laughs> um, when did they say that that hit the tree? When did they say that the car hit a tree? Well, what we what we know is that the Westman pulled that in there later report, not that night, because it's not in the narrative, unless they told that to Smith that night, but no, because the narrative says, spun out in the ditch, car in the ditch, so right. that doesn't say anything about a tree, but right. yet when he writes his accident report, he says, responding to the report of a car into a tree. The accident report that was written six, six days later. Okay. So there, he's definitely indicating that there, that, that Saturn hit a tree, okay. and we know two reconstructionists say no, we know damage is not consistent, and we know that the other part is the problem with that he did not put the rag in the in the accident report. Something that was so important that he felt that he had to tell the Westman that it had to be put out to be well the next day, but was not treated as evidence. Was not important after that fact. So why? That's the big question. Is why, and that's and we want answers. We the people want answers. So that's where I stand. Yes, sir. Who wrote up that report? Was it state police, local, or sheriff's department? Sergeant Cecil Smith, the person who responded to the scene. And who was he with? Cable Police Department, sir. Which one? Cable Police Cable. Department. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma John, sir, thank you for going back to that. Thank you, David. So guy that showed up that wasn't on location. And I'm thinking back, didn't the guy that was on location also show up and they had a conversation? Yes, yeah, they did. So it doesn't make sense when somebody called one driver and then somebody else called another driver. Either that or he heard it on the page. Yeah. Oh, well, that's fine. Yeah. And and that's why he was upset today. And it's Northfield, right? Northland. Northland. Didn't you agree with them earlier in the day? Yes, earlier in the day. And this is where this is where we know that uh, Chief Williams was driving the uh, driving the sedan earlier in the day, and he slid off the road in a parking lot. Sedan SUV. What's that? Sedan SUV. A sedan. Okay. And that is when um, that Cecil Smith responded to the problem that he was in the that he was stuck in a parking lot, and that is when. They knew that he was intoxicated and they said to get in the SUV and get out of here. And that was approximately 4 30 in the afternoon. So they put him in the SUV. He was the last person seen in the SUV. 7 30 that night, my guess is that it was people in the SUV. They let him drive himself away knowing he was drunk? He was drunk all the time. That was his, that was his, I, and I'm not just speculating on that, I've talked to a bunch of townspeople, petition comments have said that, oh yeah, you know, we know this has been going on for years, they've been letting like, him drive drunk for years. So, again, we've got, we've got the silence that is definite. It's the silence that is definite. Um, John, did Yes, that's normally okay. what they are usually driving. So why they weren't in the vehicle that day. It could have been a matter of a call early and that day required the SUV to maybe go up the driveway or something. And they didn't take the sedan, they took the, you know, they went out with the chief, the chief might have been at the TV or whatever. And they said, well, just take the SUV because it's four wheel drive, of course. You know, that, that's the only thing I can think of. Well, the chief was in the SUV and Williams was in the sedan. The, no, yeah, yeah. And then a sedan went off the road, and then they switched. And then they switched at approximately 4.30 in the afternoon. And there's witness witnesses for that? Yeah, uh, this guy Dan from down there has actually heard the scanner report for that, and I'm still trying to get that. And it seems like that one is, is uh, missing as well. So. I have not spoken to Dick McKean lately, but I know that there are people that he's, he is on the list of several, several people that will be being questioned soon, if he has gone already. I, I know that they're on the list, but I don't know if they've been talked to yet. I'm not privy to that information. They are on the list. And 
I know the people have refused, the Westmans refused to talk to anyone else now. Um, they're done. Um, uh, so where we're at, where we're at, you know, uh, I'm hoping that this new um, media attention that we're getting and all the community support will will help us dig deeper and help us get more answers. And this is what I wanted today, because I wanted the community here, and I wanted people to hear what the truth is. It's not, you know, I've said a couple things that I speculate on, but other than that, I've told you all the truth. It's all facts, you know? But like I said, you get these facts, and you can't make a decision of what really happens, so you just have to speculate, and that's why I so speculate. But the big picture, in the big picture, there's something really rotten in Able to Andrew. And I'm saying it's the police or the town's people or whatever, but something just isn't right. So. What's that? Is it true that they didn't want this event that is get today in, in their town? Well, one thing that I will tell you is that we had the event last year at the, at the uh, lodge at Mountain Lakes. And they, the Mountain Lakes people donated lodge to us. They were very great and everything. Um, I would have gotten the same place again this year, but I didn't feel good energy in Havel. I didn't, because of what I just told you all. I didn't want to be in that energy. Today, <clears throat> I got chills right now. The, the energy here today is perfect. It's, it's a bunch of positive people who, who are concerned and they want to know answers. So, 